Today we are on the Gettysburg battlefield and we are currently at one of my favorite locations on that battlefield. We are on Powers Hill. Now Powers Hill is not a name that really jumps to mind when you think about Gettysburg. You think about Cemetery Hill or Little Round Top when you think about prominent hills. But Powers Hill played an important role in the defense of the Union right flank, particularly on the morning of July 3rd, 1863, okay? So where is exactly Powers Hill located? Well, Melissa is gonna pan to her right, and hopefully you might be able to see the visitor center through the trees. You might just be able to make out the new visitor center through the trees. And bring it back to me, Melissa. And at the base of the hill, behind Melissa, is the Baltimore Pike, the roadway there. Go ahead and pan around, and you might be able to look down. You'll see a house which sits right on the Baltimore Pike. And then Melissa's going to pan a little bit more to the left, and you're going to see the slope of Lower Culp's Hill. So we're basically just west of Culp's Hill, a little southwest of Culp's Hill. And if you look closely, you might be able to see the park road going up Lower Culp's Hill. So briefly, as many of you are, I'm sure, aware, on the evening of July 2nd, 1863, Allegheny Johnson's division attacks Culp's Hill and almost really breaks through the Union lines, but is held back. Now, portions of the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac, commanded by Major General Slocum, had been moved out of that area to try to reinforce the Little Round Top region. They arrived there, were told that the area was secure, and they marched back. And when they got back, they found that their earthworks on Lower Culp's Hill were occupied by Confederate troops. The 12th Corps then spends the night of July 2 and the July 3 establishing new lines in this area and also placing artillery batteries here on Powers Hill. Now, interesting, the Lieutenant Edward Muhlenberg, who is in charge of the 12th Corps Artillery Brigade, calls this Slocum's Hill because Slocum's headquarters was along the Baltimore Pike just south of the hill. It was known as Powers Hill because of Solomon Powers owned it at the time and he owned a quarry operation. And I'm not sure, Melissa's gonna pan to her right and you'll see a tree line. I don't know if what's inside that tree line is park property or not, but if you go to the tree line and look in, you can see some large pits that might have been the quarry operation in there. Maybe some of that. But they establish artillery on this hill. She's gonna pan and you're gonna see a monument, and I'm gonna use my cheat sheet here, to Lieutenant, Lieutenant Charles Winnegar's New York battery. There were two cannons from his battery here, two 10-pounder uh, Parrot rifles, and then across the pike you're going to see more high ground, and that is known as McAllister's Hill. And two of his artillery pieces were also on that hill. Spinning back around, you also have a monument I'm standing next to, to Battery E, Pennsylvania Light Artillery, often referred to as Knapp's Battery for its first commander, but during at Gettysburg it was commanded by an officer named Atwell, and it had six Parrot rifles here, just like I'm standing next to. On up to the top of Powers Hill, you see the monument to Lieutenant Charles Rigby's first Maryland Battery. That is actually from the Artillery Reserve. These other batteries are from the 12th Corps. Down along the Baltimore Pike, they positioned two more batteries. So there are 26 artillery pieces in this immediate area. 26 artillery pieces. And I, I love coming up here because it's an important part of the battlefield. I've been coming up here a long time and I, I, I think I remember the first time I was up here, there were a lot more tree cover, but it's very open now so you can see across to Culp's Hill. Melissa and I broke trail to get up here today. We're the, we're, we're the only tracks in the snow print to come up here, so it's not that heavily visited. But as you may have read recently or heard, the park is now implementing a new uh, interpretive panel program, and they're putting in a whole bunch of new panels throughout the park. We talked to uh, National Park Service Ranger Chris Gwynn about this last October, and he showed you some of the drafts. And one of those panels is going to be located here on Powers Hill. So hopefully more people will get to come up here and appreciate this 
summit, and it isn't installed yet, but it will be in the near future. Brigadier General Alpheus Williams uh, sort of toggles and commanded his division in the 12th Corps during the fight. And after these artillery positions are established, he says that on the morning of July 3rd, they're going to open fire up here at dawn and unleash hell on the Confederates down on the lower slope of Culp's Hill. And that's exactly what they do. About 4.30 in the morning, these artillery pieces open fire across the valley to Culp's Hill. And again, Melissa, you just want to span around, spin around, and you can see Culp's Hill and how close it is. It's about, I don't know, six to 800 yards away. These cannons are going to fire for the next six hours. And the Confederates, there's many con accounts by the Confederates down there about the devastating gunfire that's delivered upon them. And it's sort of the, the galling fire. And there are going to be renewed Confederate efforts to take Culp's Hill on the morning of July 3rd. But they're going to eventually fail in part because of this artillery fire. So the Confederates are very exposed, but also unfortunately, for the Union troops down there of the 12th Corps, they are going to suffer heavily from friendly fire from these field pieces. Culp's Hill, I'm not a Gettysburg expert, but just off the top of my head, I would say that the positions along Culp's Hill are as close as some of the positions enemy opposing forces are during the battle. On the night of July 2 and 3, the opposing sides have to speak in a whisper because they're so close together. And of course, because they're so close together, there's more uh, terrible op a chance that of, of friendly fire occurring, and that's what happens. There's numerous reports by the federal regiments down there that they're getting fired upon by these cannons by their own men. Two officers in particular, Colonel Livingston Price of the 145th New York and Colonel James Selfridge of the 46th Pennsylvania, complain to their immediate superior that they're getting friendly fire. They're told not to worry about it. They go back to their commands. The problem does not abate, and they eventually take matters in their own hands and come across the pike, and they run into General Slocum and tell them what's happening. Slocum orders them to withdraw to some extent and also notifies these gunners that they're firing into their own men. The commander of the 20th Connecticut, Lieutenant Colonel William Worcester, wrote, we would advance and drive the Confederates back, and then we would have to fall back because our own artillery fire was striking us so heavily. And if you look across, you can't really see, but I can kind of see a across the valley where the monument to the Spangler Spring is located. And there's always a myth about uh, the night of July 2nd, how soldiers of both sides gathered and helped each other out at that spring. You know, sort of a romanization. But in the meantime, the reality is, friendly fire is killing and wounded killing and wounded many Union soldiers across the way, sort of the reality of, of war here. And the fighting across the way is extremely nasty, too. You can also kind of see Spangler's Meadow from here. There were several efforts by the Federals to charge across that meadow, and they were beaten back. And when the Federal soldiers sent out stretcher bearers to bring back their wounded, the Confederates fired at them and drove them away. So. I hope that you get a chance uh, when the new waysides are, are in particularly to come up here to Powers Hill and check it out. It's really beautiful up here, isn't it, Melissa? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the snow makes it even uh, prettier. And But on the downside, the cold may be affecting the mics, and I hope you can hear me okay. I hope it's not a problem. I'm speaking as loudly as I can. But this is a really cool overlook place on the battlefield with an interesting and terrible story to tell about friendly fire. So Melissa, do we have anyone that wants to say hello? Yeah, we've got lots of people on today. Uh, Janet Norton is here, Stephen Halcombe, Bill Beard, uh, Harry Smelter's on. Hey everybody, hey Harry. Um, Sandy Wright Clochback, uh, Joey Basta, Michael Wolfel, Buddy Shover, uh, John Verrill's here. Hey John. Hi John. Uh, Jeffrey Holmes. Uh, James Slider, uh, lots of people. So. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm sorry we were a little late. We were trying to get everything working. It's really frustrating for us because we kind of, we, we bought these mics, you know, we do this sort of on our own and they work when we test them out and every time we go out in the field they seem to glitch on us and we just don't know why. So we're going to have to try something else. 
But I hope that you've enjoyed this quick visit to Powers Hill because it is an overlooked area of the battlefield, one of those places that if you've come here a number of times, you may not have visited this battlefield, this part of it, but when you come here, you'll get sort of an interesting and different impression of the engagement. So that's going to wrap it up here for us. I wanted to talk quickly so the phone wouldn't drop out on us. And we're going to go to another location of the battlefield and try to bring you some more interesting information. And we also just want to show you some beautiful panoramas of the battlefield in the snow. It's not always, you can't always get here when it snows. So that's another reason. I don't know, Melissa, just kind of move there. Look how pretty that is with the sun coming in and the monument to uh, Rigby's battery. Just really, really interesting place to visit up here. All right, folks, we will see you shortly as we move to another location on the battlefield. And until then, this is Dana Shope and Melissa Wynn from Civil War Times Magazine signing off from Powers Hill on the Gettysburg Battlefield.